Well, kia ora and welcome to Equalise. It's so awesome to have you two amazing mana wahine to start our first session today. Now, me, I'm going to go to you first. You've actually had quite a busy 48 hours announcing a title defence of your world uh, title bout. But I want to go back to the start. And I'd like to know, you grew up up north uh, in a small, uh, small part of New Zealand, but how much did that influence who you are today? So I grew up in Pukiporo, right up in the far north, <laughs> FFN, yeah, um, loud and proud too. Um, it's where a lot of that, that's where I get my mental strength from, is from home. You know, being, we're rough, rugged, and we're like being in the bush and in the water. That's, that's how we do it, and you know, there's no, it's not nothing flash, but it's flash to us. You know, we're living in the nature and that's the best thing. And I get all my strength from my family and definitely my roots from where I'm from, like my grandparents, where they lay, that's, that's definitely where I get my mana from, you know, cause it's something special when you go back home, you can't beat it. Like when I was a kid, I was treated home like, ah, oh, this is the most boringest place. <laughs> but growing up and realizing how special home is, and knowing where my family comes from, that's, that's the biggest strength. It's beautiful. Yeah, it is beautiful. And you speak about it with such passion and yeah. warmth when you, when you talk about home. Truly is where the heart is. Yeah. Now, for you, Dua Hay, uh, you've also had a busy week back from North America. Winners of the Pack 4 defended the title, so on to the world uh, XV later in the year. But you grew up down the East Coast. Yeah. How much has that shaped who you are as a person? Oh, similar to Mia, uh, there's a beauty coming from small places. Um, where I'm from down in the East Coast, we're about an hour away from our nearest town, or Portiki. Um, an hour away from the supermarket, the petrol station, a couple of hours away from, from the nearest takeaways. Um, and there's a beauty growing up in a rural, rugged upbringing. Um, like Mia mentioned, you're a lot closer and connected to your whānau, not only your immediate whānau, but your extended whānau. And as you know, myself and my, my sister wanted to play all sorts of sports when we were younger, being so far away from, from town, we were so fortunate to not only have the support of our, our parents, but the support of our community to drive us to trainings all across the countryside um, and whatever we wanted to do there was always someone there who loved us enough to, to take us to all these things. Um, and now as an adult, it's, it's part of who I am. My identity, where I come from, my tūranga wai wai, um, is me. Yeah. Awesome. So, Mia, I know that you played a lot of team sports, and including a bit of rugby, a bit of touch rugby growing up. Uh, you know, how did you get into boxing? My mum. <laughs> yeah. My mum, she... Well, I was playing soccer. Okay. Yeah, I was playing yeah. soccer at the yeah. time as a, a, in school and I, I needed to get fit and mum was like, I'll take you to boxing because she was doing boxing for training just to keep her fit. And my mum was like, her nickname was Mad Dog. <laughs> 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 so she was like ruthless. My mum was tough as and she played league too. So I always wanted to play league, but she would never let me play. How come? Because she didn't, she didn't want that for me. But she wanted you to do boxing? She only wanted me to do boxing just for fitness. But then I was like, nah, you're not taking this away from me. So yeah, I loved boxing. And that's how I found it, it was through my mum. She just, I was actually trying to get in for like the top soccer team in Auckland and I couldn't get, it, get in. So I was like, oh well, I'll choose boxing. <laughs> it's almost like boxing chose you. What do you love about boxing? The discipline that it has and also the su sustainability for me, you know, it's shown me how to live life and it's just kept, it gives me structure. Boxing gives me structure. It's really good. Yeah. And what about you, Rua hey? Growing up on the East Coast, lots of rugby balls chucked around. Uh, how, did, how did you get into rugby? Yeah, quite the opposite, actually. <laughs> um, when we were kids growing up, we also started playing soccer in Oporsuki, um with my cousin. So my mum would drive us to trainings because um, there was no rugby team mm -hmm. around. And 
my first memory of rugby is actually on the marae with my cousins. It wasn't at a rugby club, there was no rugby post, we'd just play in front of the whareikai when there were tangies and whatnot. Um, and it wasn't until uh, one of my older sisters came home from high school, my sister and I weren't intermediate at the time, she, she came home and she said, oh dad, I've, I've signed up to play rugby at school. And my, my older sister is very social and she joined all the free sports that you could do at high school purely for the social aspect, not for the competitive <laughs> aspect. And so my dad thought, oh, this is awesome. Your sisters can go with you. So we were like 12 playing against 18 year olds and we hated it. Um, rugby was not what it's like now. It was like no one wanted to play it. It wasn't a very popular sport for you know, young girls, teenage girls to play. There was no attraction. Um, it wasn't like a desirable sport. Everyone wanted to play netball or basketball. Um, and we played all sports, but rugby wasn't really that fun um, until they announced that rugby was going to be, or sevens was going to be in the Olympics. Then everyone wanted to play. Um, there was a lot more players that came, a lot more cross-code athletes that mm -hmm. came across. Um, and um, for my, my sister and I, our passion and love for rugby really blossomed when we started to play club rugby in Auckland. And it wasn't the sport, it wasn't the rugby that attracted us to rugby, it was the people. Um, the diversity in in ethnicities, the diversity in the, the actual physical makeup of players. You can, have, mm. you can have big, strong props, you can have tall locks, fast wingers, mm. chatty halfbacks. <laughs> There's a position for everyone, <laughs> and that's what... Kendra, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what um, drew us to the sport, mm. yeah. And, and is that what still draws you to the sport? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. The friendships, for sure. Not only um, the friendships you make with your teammates, but um, even the friendships you make with the opposition as you continue to play each other often. Because um, I mean, at the end of the day, when you all walk off the field, you just thought people, mm. yeah. So from the beginning of just starting doing boxing as a, as a form of fitness, would you ever have imagined where you are now, you know, in a position where you're defending your world title belt? No, I literally didn't, I, I hated pro boxing. I literally hated it because I was, one, I was scared. And then second, I didn't think I was a power puncher. Like, I was like, I'm not going toe to toe with people because I was like so scared of the power. And then my coach was just like, no, give it a go. And I was like, okay. I'm all for giving myself a challenge. And like, I really didn't want to do it. And I didn't see myself being where I am now. And then I gave it a go. And like my first fight, I remember walking through the ropes and then like literally having the first punch hit my head. And I was like, yeah, is that all you got? <laughs> and I was like, let's go then. I was like, yeah, let's go to war, bring it on. <laughs> so that, and then that's where I found the love, like the actual love for professional boxing. Like that first fight when she hit my head and I felt her knuckles and I was like, yeah, come on, bring it. <laughs> And then it gave me excitement, so yeah, I loved it after that. So can you explain to me, you, so you're the IBO, uh, that's the belt you've got right now. Yeah. Uh, how many different belts are there at a world title level and what's your, uh, yes, that's, that's the question. Yeah, five, there's five different okay. ones. So there's WBA, WBO, WBC, um, IBO, IBF, oh and Ring Magazine. So I'm trying to collect, not trying, I am going to collect them all. Yeah. I'm, ranked in, <laughs> I'm ranked in all of them, so that's the main thing. I'm in the top five for all the divisions besides the WBC, because we've got to wait. That one's the hardest one. So yeah, and I'm going to collect them all. Yeah, girl. <laughs> right, well, you've both had hugely significant victories to get to the top in the last six months to a year. Yeah. You know, when you, came off that fight in April earlier this year. You were the first to headline, a first female to headline a Fight for Life card. Uh, when you, when they held up your hand as the winner of that fight, what did that mean to you? Well, they didn't even raise my hand. I didn't even know the <laughs> score and I started crying. Yeah, I, I couldn't, I didn't even care about what the score was or like what the result was. 
I was just so proud of myself that I had made it that far and I, can, I had completed it. That's, I was proud of that. I wasn't proud of the result. I was proud of, man, look what I've done in two years in such a short time. I'm fighting for a world title. I never thought I'd do that. And I was like so emotionally proud because the sacrifice that I had to put, because you know, I've got five kids and I've got to manage my five children. And then also I have to manage to train and then work at the same time. So I was so proud of the effort that I put in myself. So yeah, that was. I love it how you kind of just slipped in there that you've got five kids. I mean, for goodness sakes, I've got two and it's enough just looking after two, let alone raising all these kids and doing what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, Rohe, go back. let's go back now to that amazing victory on, in, uh, on Eden Park. You know, what did it mean to you to lift that trophy and to captain the Black Ferns in doing so? Yeah, it was... I think upon reflection now, it, it was quite surreal to say that we had done what we said we were going to do, you know, like saying something and then actually being able to to realise it all the way through to the end in such like a like a gruelling tournament. Um, that, that was probably the moment that was quite surreal for me, like actually saying, oh, we got to the World Cup final and now we're world champions. Um, and that moment took, it took quite a few months to sink in for actually quite a few of us within the team, actually realising what we had done, not only in the game, in the tournament, but also like the wider impact of what that, that moment meant to, to New Zealand and, you know, that, that sporting moment meant in our, in our history. And then this moment here with the, with the FIFA World Cup, being in Aotearoa with the girls, it's even better, you know what I mean? Like seeing the crowd that was there last night, um, the ripples, the, um, I'm not a day one fan, but I'm a new <laughs> fan. And I know that there's quite a lot of us now, you know, because, oh. because it's so accessible. There's, yeah. there's so much um, on social media, there's so much on TV, and it's, yeah, it brings back a few emotions from our World Cup, but it's just cool to see um, what the power of women's sport and what it can do when it's available and accessible to all. Yeah. yeah. In the lead up to the Fight for Life and your World Championship uh, debut in, in the ring, uh, you, you talked openly and honestly about some of the really dark places you've been in, in your life. And, and we've talked about this, so I have permission to ask yeah. about this, but you've been a victim of domestic violence and that's something that no woman uh, should ever have to go through. Yeah. But how have you continued to live um, through that and be the amazing, vibrant person that we feel on stage today? So if you were to ask me a year ago, I probably would still be silenced. But it was my team, my, you know, my team and that made my coach that really brought the strength out of me and said to me, like, he was like, it's okay what you've been through. He said, we're here to help and don't be ashamed of what you've been through. And I, I like people, I've heard heaps of people say that to me and I'm like, nah, you just don't know nothing. And I've never actually listened because I've just, it's gone through one ear and out the other because I just like, oh, you guys don't understand. But then it just hit me, that one time that hit me and my coach and then my gym, my team, because I, I opened, I, I was very open with my team because I built the courage to speak to them. And that was the only way for, see, because boxing's such a mental game, mm. like people think it's physically, it's very mental. And so for me to get through that ring, I have to be open on who I am. So when my coach told me like, it's okay to speak about it, then I thought, hey, why don't I speak about it? Because there's other, there's not just me, there's other females that, and I knew some that were hiding too. Mm. And I thought, hey, I want to speak out, I want to help others too, because literally I was so embarrassed and I was ashamed to speak. I didn't, because I felt like, okay, all the abuse that I, I blamed myself. So I was like, I'm, I'd rather stay hidden. But then I thought, no, I, 
the light switch turned on for me and I was like, I am no longer hiding under that abuser because I was living under that abuser for 10 years. 10 years I lived under his darkness Mm. and I allowed him to over to control me. Mm. He wasn't with me physically, like he was locked up, but he was still controlling me because I was still staying silent. And so it just flicked and I was like, nah, I want, I want to normalize it. I want to change the narrative because it's okay if we go through abuse. It's, you know, go and speak to others. Don't be afraid. Don't speak to one person because that's what I learned. I only speak to one. Speak to multiple because other people have different views and they will support you and help you. Don't be ashamed. It's okay. Because that, you know, the abuser wants you to stay silent. They don't want you to come out. And so if you stay silent, you're living under them. But if you speak to multiple people, then they start running away from you. And then you start controlling your life. So yeah, that's, that's why I spoke up. You've taken the power back in your life. Yes. And, and that is so inspiring. And it's so inspiring how open you've been because I know there might be people here who have come here today to hear you and hear the, the strength in your voice now. So, uh, tēnā kwea. Thank you. Uh, Rohei, the Black Ferns, uh, despite all the historical success in the lead up to last year's World Cup, you know, it was very publicly um, out there that it was a challenging time, that end of year tour in 2021 uh, was, the results weren't great, uh, the review as a result of it. Um, how did the Black Ferns rebuild that culture to get to the team that became the top of the world? Yeah, uh, the, the short answer is um, we got new coaches. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no, that's, that is probably the truth. Um, not only did we get new coaches who, who changed the way that we played, but we also, um, our current director of rugby now, Alan Bunting, Alan Bunting was, I came in last year as our, um, he was a coach of leadership and culture, which we'd never had someone like that before in our environment. Um, we always have coaches that take care of a lot of the, the physical aspects, um, S&C, mental skills, you know, all that sort of stuff, nutrition, um, how, how a team prepares, but we hadn't had anyone uh, directly responsible for the, for the, the culture within the team. Um, and so Alan Bunting came in and there was, a, there, was a lot of, there was a lot of change that came about um, after our end of year tour. And change sometimes is really good and it was really good for our team. It shone a light on uh, uh, some things that, you know, we well, definitely don't stand for now as a team, that's for sure. Um, we were able to, with Bunts, actually recreate an environment where we were not only valued as players, but people. Um, I hope Mia talks about being open and honest with your team. Um, and for those who are familiar with the Whare Tapa Whā framework, um, that's kind of like the framework that we work off within our team. And so we all have our own whare. Um, and those of us who are, who are brave enough will get up in front of our team, not only the players, but our coaches and management staff as well, and present our whare to our team. And I think what's important with that is is when we prepare, when, I don't know, teams like the ABs and stuff, when you're preparing, you're not together all the time, you only know each other as rugby players, you only see each other at training, you don't spend every single day together, so you don't know each other as people, you don't know each other's background, but being able to share our whares with each other um, shone a different light on us as, as people, as humans, and, and our whanos, our stories and our backgrounds, and. Um, created a lot more trust, was really what it did, um, within, the, within the team, not only within the playing group, but with also with, with our management, um, and kind of ignited that shift, I guess, from, from a team that had been playing well, and then to a team that was, you know, yeah. And finally, we've got a lot of rangatahi here today, and I know seeing you on stage, both of you today, will be incredibly inspiring for them. If you could give our young wahine 
one bit of advice about the pursuit to the top, what would it be? Believe in yourself and don't let anyone tell you you can't do it. Because I had so many people that told me like, oh, you're, never, you're not gonna be good at that, you're not gonna be good. Nah, honestly, if you just work hard, train hard, you can do it. Don't ever let anyone tell you you can't do something because you are destined to, we are all destined to be great. Believe in yourself, back yourself, and surround yourself with positive energy and have hate, just faith. Faith is the biggest. For me, I believe in myself. And I, when I first walked back into the gym, I was like, okay, my coach believes I'm gonna be a world champ. Okay, that's my goal. And I, there were so many people been telling me like, nah, you, you're not gonna do it. And I was like, you know what? I am, I'm gonna, I believe in myself. So believe in yourself and just do, don't let anyone tell you you can't. I hate it when people t- are so negative. Surround yourself with positive. If they're negative, walk away. They're not good news. Stay in the positive light and keep chasing what you want. Mm. Doesn't have to be sports. It can even be if you want to be a lawyer or school, you know. Be proud of the little things as well. It's the littlest things that get us to the biggest things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tina Koroa. Uh, mana wahine, fafutai, telelava. Thank you so much for your insights this morning. I think you've certainly set the stage for us here today uh, in your relentless hope for better, for your, not just for yourselves, for your whanau, for who you are, uh, but for women and actually for the world. So yeah. thank you so much for your amazing korero this morning.